chat. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna get started now. So hi everyone, Amy Claussen here again with the Niagara on the Lake Museum. I'm the Director of Finance and Marketing. Um, I'm gonna be monitoring the Q&A today. Um, so if you have any questions for Tony throughout the presentation, feel free to type them in that Q&A box and I will uh, field them to him either at the end of the presentation or if there's another appropriate time to do that, I can do that. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties or problems with your screen, you can put them in the chat and I will do my best to help you. Um, remember, you can uh, move your, um, the, the speaker view around, uh, you should be able to move that around if you can't see something on the slides. So we have 80 people signed up today again. So um, I think we've got about 55 in the, the uh, program so far. Hopefully the rest will be joining us shortly. Um, and uh, thank you for, for joining us with webinars. Uh, hopefully you'll uh, come back next week and the week after we've got them scheduled till the end of June, every Thursday at two o'clock. So today our presenter is Tony Chisholm, who many of you know in this community. Tony was on the War of 1812 Bicentennial Committee and chair of the Burning of Niagara event in uh, 2013. He also served on the Communities in Bloom Committee for the town for four years and is currently vice chair of the town's Heritage Trail Committee. Tony has worked with the museum as a volunteer tour guide for uh, over seven years now, and he's currently president of the Friends of Fort George, and he was also named Volunteer of the Year for the town in 2015. So our topic today is marathon swimmers on Lake Ontario, and Tony has firsthand experience with this, um, accompanying his son on a, on a swim across the lake in 2008 and several others since then. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tony. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate that. Hi everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today. And thanks also to the Niagara on the Lake Museum. Uh, in my mind, this is the greatest little museum in Canada. <laughs> As Amy mentioned, my background in marathons, marathon swimming started in 2008. Up, in that, up until that point, I really didn't know much more about it uh, than the fact that Marilyn Bell had swum the lake. But in 2008, my son decided to swim and raise money for the hospital for sick children. I accompanied him on the swim in August in my powerboat. It was an amazing experience, and I'll talk about what we went through and what he went through basically in my presentation a little later. Uh, by the way, for those of you sitting close to your computer, I just wash my hands, so this will be a virus-free presentation. <laughs> uh, anyway, after Sean's swim, we stayed involved with other swim attempts. Sean became a swim master for the governing organization called Solo Swims Ontario. And I accompanied him and the swims in my boat, The Pursuit of Happiness. Together, we've accompanied perhaps another 10 swimmers in, on their marathon adventure over the lake. My specialty is navigation. Uh, setting a true course, I consider to be vital for these swims. Sean's expertise, my son, is as a swim master in planning and the safety for the swimmer. Okay, I wanted to start with Marilyn Bell's swim because that's the beginning. Marilyn Bell was, of course, the first person to swim the lake, and her story is that of a true heroine. Her story is full of ad adventure and determination. In the early 1950s, I'll just read this, marathon swimming was a very popular sport and was a continuation of the distance swims along the shoreline of the CNE that had been going on since 1927. So this is a very old tradition in Toronto. The lake has a wicked ability to invert temperatures after a north wind, and the temperatures can drop anywhere on the lake from the 70s down to the 50s or lower. Combine that with treacherous waves, and contrary currents from the Humber River, and you can quickly see why the 52 kilometer distance from Niagara on the Lake to Toronto has never been an easy one to conquer. I love this uh, front cover from the Globe and Mail uh, that covers Maryland's swim. The day of the special event for her was September 9th, 1954. CNE, this is an interesting story. The CNE officials announced that a feature of that year's exhibition would be an attempt by an American marathon swimmer by the name of Florence Chadwick. 
to cross the cold waters of Lake Ontario. Chadwick was due to be paid $10,000 on the successful completion of the swim. It seemed a sure thing since she held a total of 10 world swimming records. A contract was subsequently signed and confirmed that the American would, do, would be the only one entitled to the prize money. When Chadwick decided to commence her attempt, it was after 11 o'clock on September the 8th. There had been a storm the previous few days. So this is 11 o'clock at night, it's in the dark. Meanwhile, two Canadian women swimmers were lurking in the nearby woods. One was a well-known local swimmer, Winnie Roach, and the other a virtually unknown Toronto school girl, Marilyn Bell. Chadwick was in the water only a few minutes when the two Canadians, unbeknownst to most people associated with the Chadwick attempt, entered the lake. And this is a direct quote from Marilyn below. I thought my swim, if I finished it, would be on the back pages of the paper. So I thought I would just climb out and go home and a few of my friends would congratulate me. Not quite, Marilyn, not quite. Marilyn's story of heroism. Her coach was Gus Ryder and he was in a boat ahead of her. So don't forget this is in the middle of the night. It was dark, no one knew where the other two swimmers were. And Chadwick was being followed by her flotilla of boats but after the two girls jumped in, no one knew where they were. And uh, no one knew anything about the drama that was to unfold as Marilyn battled four meter waves, lamprey eels, exhaustion and numbness. Ryder was there beside her and shouted encouragement and fed a swimmer corn syrup from a cup. These were the early days. At dawn, Marilyn had covered 22 kilometers. She didn't know it, but she'd already eclipsed Chadwick who had become violently ill in the choppy water. When Marilyn became numb and glassy eyed at 10.30 in the morning, the following morning, of course, Ryder took out a blackboard and wrote on it, flow is out. <laughs> soon, uh, soon the other swimmer pulled out as well. Marilyn's best friend, Joan Cook, shouted encouragement from the boat and she started swimming again. Meanwhile, word was spreading, not only across Toronto, but across all of Canada. A flotilla of media appeared and tens of thousands of people, literally, and eventually 25,000 gathered on shore to see her come in. Success. At 6.30 in the evening of the following day, of course, Marilyn reached her limit and Ryder ignored her father's wishes to pull her out. He asked Joan to swim beside her friend. Driven west by the current to Sunnyside, Marilyn finally touched the breakwater at 8.06 p.m. Because of the currents, she had actually swum 64 kilometers. Pandemonium broke out as Marilyn came ashore, the undisputed heroine of all of Canada. Proud Canadians showered her with more than $50,000 in prizes and gifts. There's another great picture of Gus Ryder writing instructions to Marilyn. Marilyn Bell today. Marilyn has come to Niagara on the Lake in the past few years as the governing organization Solo Swims Ontario updates the swim plaque here in Niagara on the Lake with that year's successful swimmers. I've met and talked with her for the past few years. She's a tiny but very impressive lady who actively supports the marathon swimming community today. She's full of energy, especially, especially for an 82 year old. To her credit, Marilyn still keeps in touch with Cross Lake swimmers and comes out every year as this plaque is dedicated. What about today? These quotes are from a book by Laura Young who wrote Solo Never Alone. And this book, it's a great book. If you wanna get it, it's available at the museum. But I like these quotes. I particularly like these quotes and pulled them out. Swimmer versus lake remains the one human lake interaction where the lakes are in charge. There can never be a guide to swimming across a great lake. Everyone who steps into great lake waters, relieved at last just to be doing it, shares the true intention of swimming over the curve of the earth to the other side of the inland sea. I thought that was very poetic. Despite all of technology's advancements, a crossing finally comes down to one swimmer wearing nothing but a bathing suit, goggles, and a cap against all the elements. A human being who is virtually naked and alone. 
it all comes down to the luck of the weather. And as Sean and I have done many of these swims, we say the same thing. It, despite the swimmer's ability, it really comes down to what the weather conditions are and the days they select to do the swim. Solo Swims Ontario. After 1974, all of the swims going across Lake Ontario and the other Great Lakes are regulated by law by an official organization called Solo Swims Ontario, SSO. In 1974, there was a 17 year old young lad named Neil McNeil. He decided to swim from Youngstown to Toronto with only one 12 foot boat for support. When the boat's motor broke down at night, Neil decided to go it alone. And that was the last anybody ever saw of the swimmer. Out of the coroner's inquest and with the sponsorship of the Ontario government, Solo Swims was born to regulate all attempts to cross the lake. Since then, no one has ever drowned. SSO's job is to keep everyone, the athlete and the crew on the boats safe on these marathon swims. Don't forget they can last up to 40 hours. Solo Swims has 66 pages of rules covering fees, trial swim, uh, which is one third of the distance in a specific time, and the swimmer's competency. Here's something most of us in Niagara on the Lake will recognize. It's the Solo Swims plaque. And this is the plaque that's uh, been recently redone and that Marilyn Bell and other people in Solo Swims Ontario comes to every year to dedicate, it, to dedicate the latest names. And I'm very pleased to say that Sean's name is on the plaque. So these are most of the questions people have. Um, how many swimmers have been successful? Approximately 60. What does it take to swim the lake? Well, that's what we're gonna to discuss today. How many have attempted the crossing each year? Uh, it varies. Uh, there were two slated, there are two slated to cross this year, but with the pools closed, I suspect that uh, they might not be able to do it, not ha having enough time to train. How many are successful? As I said, there's been 60 in total, and about half of the people who swim are successful, and roughly half are not successful. Let's use 2012 as an example of the number of swimmers and the swimmers who have attempted to swim the lake. 10 swimmers put their names forward to Solo Swims Ontario. Seven swims actually happened. Three were completed successfully. But by comparison, and this is I think a very interesting comparison, 180 people swam the English Channel that year. The distance from across the lake from Queens Royal Park here in Niagara on the Lake to Maryland Bell Park in Toronto is roughly 52 kilometers or 32 miles. However, many swimmers swim much further, having been blown off course several times during their attempt. On a swim across the lake, this is what the crew sees of the swimmer during the daylight hours. I remember I've been accompanying most of these swims on my boat, so this is the kind of stuff that I and the other people on the crew have to go through. Um, and it's, it's quite uh, a different experience than the swimmer's experience. Don't forget the average swim length of time is about 20 hours, so that's always overnight. So you have to stay awake the whole night, the whole crew has to stay awake. Um, there has to be food available, coffee to keep people awake and a rotation of, of sleeping and kayaking next to the swimmer. The stuff at night I think is really interesting because I remember very clearly with Sean for instance, um, well after dark the waves came up and all of a sudden he had sort of choppy water like this and then the waves came up to about three feet in height. So all he's got for identification in the water, everything's pitch black, of course there's no lights, all he's got is a little LED light under his uh, swim cap. And uh, I remember sitting there in the back of the boat, and this is my son, and I'm thinking, whoop, you know, what's happening now? The light would come out of the water for a few minutes, or for a few seconds, really, and then disappear as he went down below a wave. So it was a very, uh, I don't know, 
interesting time period for, for a parent to watch uh, a child swim across a lake. Of course, he wasn't a child. He was 40 years old at the time. <laughs> so there's a picture of Sean. Uh, I helped him successfully cross the lake, as I indicated. His date of the swim was August the 15th. 2008, 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I started in Queens Royal Park and just over 19 hours later, 1923, I believe, he climbed up a ladder in Toronto Harbor. Those are the straightforward facts, but the story, of course, is anything but straightforward. His training through the winter of that year, and that was, I checked with him recently, he trained for 18 months in preparation for this. It consisted of thousands of lengths in a pool accumulating once in a month with a super long swim of up to seven hours. Seven hours at one time in the pool, never leaving the pool. Back and forth, back and forth, stopping only for food. He preserved where he persevered where many would give up from boredom or frustration. He said one of the big problems was finding a pool that would allow him to swim for seven or eight hours at a time. The marathon training sessions to test strength and endurance are essential preparation for the challenge of swimming this 50 kilometers in cold, dark, and treacherous conditions. <laughs> Physical training is only one part of it, he says. Marathon swimmers need good planning and lots of determination and dedication to survive. Sean is a firefighter in Toronto and that determination is fueled by the fact that his marathon swim was raising funds for the burn unit at the hospital for sick children. At the end of his swim, when we presented a check to the hospital for sick children for over $15,000, Sick Kids Foundation President Michael O'Mahony Oma in a letter told him, when a gift like yours is reinforced by passion, energy, and commitment, it transcends everyday philanthropy. Yours is such a gift, and for that, I am very grateful. Soon after Sean hit the water, we saw storms moving across the other side of the lake. And that's one of my favorite pictures, um, because the storms, these thunderstorms, are what uh, every swimmer is afraid of. Under solo swim rules, if uh, the thunderstorm comes too close, and you can hear uh, thunder uh, on several occasions, you are obligated to pull the swimmer after all his training out of the water. A few hours later, Sean was swimming through high waves, as I mentioned, and treacherous rollers created by the winds from these storms. In the power boat, never far away, and there were, uh, there were I was in the power boat, and there were two other Zodiacs and a 30-foot sailboat. Practically all of the crew during the wave height were fighting seasickness. The waves came out of the north and head on, pushing Sean back and making him work much harder earlier on than he had planned, of course. Then the long black night, sometime after midnight, the water calmed and Sean's speed picked back up. But the westerly winds remained strong and pushed the boats and the swimmers to the east. This is a common and these winds cause most swimmers to, move, to miss their intended destination as they were blown east past the Toronto Islands. So we had to keep forcing him on course and to swim further to the west and undoubtedly adding extra miles to his intended distance. On some of these swims, uh, Sean and I have been on the boat and we're actually aiming the boat more towards Oakville. The swimmer can see the CN Tower and he's saying, why aren't I swimming in that direction? And we're like, well, I'm sorry, but you've got to swim to the left to stay on course. Finally that night, and the morning, dawn arrived and trouble. Sean swam into an inversion of cold water. In the temperature inversion, the water dropped from 68 degrees on his swim to 58 in a few seconds. The first pacer that went in had trouble with the cold water and had to be pulled out, shivering. This was a very difficult time. If the water drop, temperature dropped any more, he would definitely get hypothermia and the swim would be over. To his credit, he got through this inversion, but, but now that he approached the city, he had to face the current coming out of the Humber River. All swimmers have to face this. He had a hundred reasons to quit up to this point, and to his credit, he persevered. In the end, he was greeted as a fireman by the William Lyon Mackenzie fireboat and a fire truck on shore. 
firefighters dropped the ladder over the wall in 19 hours and 20 minutes after he started his swim, he climbed out and was greeted by a hundred friends and the press. The fireboat put on a great display to add to the backdrop. The whole event was an amazing and exciting adventure for everyone involved. And this is a quote from Sean. It was by far the toughest thing I ever did. Uh, I guess so. Uh, so this is at the end of 18 hours of training and just an incredible thing he went through. Uh, one, one of the interesting things are the dangers that uh, swimmers have to face. I, I brought along a little hat to show you. I should put it on, I guess. This is my shark hat. <laughs> That's one thing swimmers don't have to worry about in Lake Ontario with sharks. They have a lot of other serious uh, problems they can face. We have already talked about thunderstorms. Uh, high winds create waves. And then there's the ocean going ships. Uh, the shipping channel is just two miles off the shore of Niagara on the lake. And uh, very often swimmers like starting at night. And of course these ships are moving at 30 or 40 kilometers an hour and it's very difficult to get them to slower turn. So it can be very dangerous with a swimmer crossing the, swimming sh the, uh, the shipping channel in the evening. Fatigue is an obvious one, but hypothermia, as we've already discussed, uh, swimming through these thermal clients of cold water, uh, very, very tough on the swimmers, and it's very often the cause of a swim not being completed. The swimmer is just, too fatigued, too cold, and he's starting to show signs of hypothermia. And finally, currents. Um, if there's a storm, for instance, uh, in, in Ontario, further north, uh, inland, uh, then the water from the Humber uh, starts flowing strongly. The current at the edge of at the Humber River, where it dumps into Lake Ontario, starts to become strong. And that's just when the swimmer is suffering the most fatigue. And all of a sudden, this current comes up and on, on several swims, Sean and I would just be sitting there for half an hour, an hour, looking at the GPS and we're not moving at all. The swimmer just can't get through and break into the current. It's also very interesting as to what the swimmers are allowed to wear. Um, this is a question I, I often get. Uh, you know, how, how come they're not wearing wetsuits? They're not allowed to wear wetsuits under solo swim rules. They're only allowed to wear a bathing suit, uh, bathing cap and goggles. Not much protection. Not much protection at all. So as you can see, this is the close-up of the swimming plaque that shows Sean's name, his age, uh, the fact he's from Canada, the date of his swim, the time it took him south to north, 51 kilometers. I also wanted to point out the person that swam before him because it's very interesting. Jay Sardula, it took him, get this, 41 hours. Hard to imagine. Jay spent a couple of days in the hospital after his swim, but 41 hours, that's unbelievable. Canada has a shining history in marathon swimming, starting with Marilyn Bell. All these swimmers talk about are waves, cold, currents, and unpredictable weather. But they also can talk about the glorious nights and the beautiful sunrises on the mighty lake. This is one another one of my favorite pictures just after the sun was coming up and as we approach Toronto. What a great sight it is. And as you can see, the water had calmed down and uh, it was just terrific to be, to be there at that time after such a long, dark and scary evening. Brian Finley, he's head of SSO Solo Swims of Ontario, he said that thanks to the ever-changing winds, the threat of thunderstorms, waves, and the constant worry of cold water thermoclines, it is one of the toughest marathon swims in the world. It's become a very popular marathon swim too. English Channel course is the, the most popular, and there are five or six other major swim routes uh, around the world. California, Catalina Island, places like that. But uh, Lake Ontario has become uh, known as one of the toughest and uh, 
and definite swims to tackle for a marathon swimmer. Water temperatures have been recorded off Niagara on the lake at 23 degrees Celsius, and the same day, only seven degrees Celsius off Toronto. So you can see that the water temperature isn't consistent and that the swimmer has to be prepared for this. If the wind picks up quickly, it blows the warm surface layer off, revealing the dangerous cold water that always lies just a few feet below the surface. Lake Ontario is as powerful as it is unpredictable. And again, as Sean and I had said, the lake is in charge. As a swimmer, you are, on, you are one with the moment, the water, the sun, the sky, and the waves. As to the final outcome, it comes down to a swimmer, barely clothed, and the lake. And always the lake decides. There's some interesting swimming records. Um, I think today John Scott is listening in. I think he's got the fastest swim record at 14 hours and 40 minutes, 42 minutes. Uh, Vicki Keith swam the lake in both directions in 1987. Um, Trinity Arsenal looks to be the youngest swimmer at the age of 14. What an amazing accomplishment for her. And Pat Gallant just uh, a year or two ago is the oldest swimmer at 66 years of age. Uh, there's one of my sh favorite shots. This was a couple of years ago when uh, Marilyn Bell was here uh, and John Scott's uh, the man uh, standing behind her with uh, blonde hair and uh, Vicki Keith, a few of the other swimmers. Uh, these are all marathon swimmers, successful marathon swimmers. And I had this slide because this is what everybody has in mind when they start uh, training for these swims, the goal. Let's get to Toronto. Thank you very much for your time today. I hope I've answered most of your questions. If there are some chats, Amy, maybe you could let me know what people wanna know. Yeah, we have a couple questions. And if anyone else has any more, feel free to write them in the Q&A there. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, but uh, Shauna had asked if any of the swims scheduled for this year are still a go um, with all the pandemic and, and maybe when would they have been scheduled um, for this year? Sure, uh, there, there are two. I just checked before I started this. There, were, there are two uh, men scheduled to swim uh, in July. The end, one is at the end of July, the other is at the end of August. As I said, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if those happen because they haven't been able to get any pool time uh, for training, which is really tough. And um, um, so to a year, that's probably a pretty fairly quiet year if they do both go swimming. Um, and then Jillian Best asks, uh, what is the main reason for a swim to not happen? Weather. Um, very often uh, the swimmers, uh, pick two windows or a window that lasts four days because it's so um, so unpredictable. The thunderstorms, one summer I remember three or four years ago, there seemed to be a thunderstorm every single day out in the lake. And this isn't uncommon. So you, 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 want, uh, you don't want an east wind because then the waves come all the way down the lake. Uh, you don't want a north wind because then you're facing uh, the wind as you start out. It makes it much, much more difficult. So really it is, it comes down to the weather. And because the swims are so long, the weather can be one thing when you start and totally change halfway through the, to the swim. Um, Judy wants to know um, what the coating is they put on. And then uh, Elizabeth Oliver Malone is also asking, does the grease help against hypothermia and does it get washed off? Uh, Sean used, that's the one I, I uh, have most knowledge of, lanolin. It didn't get washed off. It got washed off on my boat when he finally got <laughs> off. <laughs> and, uh, and it almost became a permanent part of his skin. It was very difficult for him to get it off. No, it does not protect from hypothermia or from the cold. What it does is if, if you, you think about the swimmer's action, he's, you, and you can see in the picture below, he's using his arms. I figure there's something like 50,000 arm strokes for the swim. So the chafing under his arm is one of the worst things uh, that can happen. So he uses that lanolin to prevent the chafing. Um, Diane Kendall wants to know if the swimmer is allowed to take a break anytime. I'm sorry? Is the swimmer allowed to take a break? 
yeah, sure, they're allowed to take a break, but uh, generally they don't take breaks. Um, they eat every half hour. You're not allowed to touch the boat. If you touch the boat, you're disqualified. So food is handed to them either on a stick or thrown to them. It's usually in liquid form. And uh, usually the breaks last less than 30 seconds as they eat what they can every half hour. So that happens day and night crossing the lake. They have to constantly take in a source of nourishment and uh, generally, uh, no, they don't take breaks other than that eating break. So Babs wants to know in the same vein, what do they do to take care of their normally bod bodily functions? Well, they're in the lake, so <laughs> <laughs> it's anybody's guess. And, and tell Babs to keep her mind clean. <laughs> um, uh, Cheryl's asking, uh, are most of the swims in the direction of Toronto because it's the easiest landmark to see? Uh, that's an interesting question. And the answer to that is a flat no. The reason is that there's a current coming out of the Niagara River. So uh, for the first few miles, maybe three or so, uh, they pick up quite a bit of speed following that current. That was one of the navigational problems that, uh, that I had to face is how to take full advantage of the current for as long as possible before actually heading to, towards Toronto. So when the swimmer comes out of the Niagara River, um, I found the most effective way is to keep them just a couple of miles offshore, but starting to head west along the shore where the current is. And then when the current starts to dissipate, then turn towards the city and do a straight course uh, for Toronto. So the main reason they swim from Niagara-on-the-Lake to Toronto is to get that help from the current. And if they were swimming in the other direction, they would get hindered by the current. Um, can uh, Judy, uh, Judy Killian wants to know, can you speak to the role of the packers? How many are there? The people on the ships, on the boats? I think the, that's the crews. Yeah. yeah, the crew. The crew requirements are a minimum of probably eight or 10 people. A lot of these swims will be as many as 15 or 20 people. Um, there's usually a doctor on board, somebody who knows CPR. Um, there's the coach, um, this, there's a group of two or three to feed the person, get the food ready. There's navigational um, you know, jobs to do. Um, there's usually one boat out front pointing the way uh, and then a speedboat uh, for quick evacuation if necessary. There's kayaks to be close to the swimmer so they don't feel they're too far away from the boat. You can imagine in a power boat you'd be worried about running over the swimmer all the time. So uh, you have to stay well away from the swimmer and you don't want to stay in front of them because of the smell and stink of the, of the engine in the water. So uh, it, it does take usually three to four, sometimes five boats and um, often 15 to 20 people, all whom have to be fed. And, and lit at night too. You, you think that's tough for the swimmer at night, you know, seeing the swimmer and not running over them. But in fact, all the people on the boats have to have lights on them as well in case they fall overboard. Right. Um, Sarah wanted to, wants to know if a swimmer starts out and then has to stop, are they allowed to attempt again the next year? Uh, yes, uh, they, 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 they pay a fee to Solo Swims Ontario for the swim master help and uh, the rest of the help that Solo Swims provides. And that fee usually will be held uh, for the following year if the swimmers uh, turn back by weather or whatever conditions. Yeah, so, and a lot of them do. I've known some that have, have, have attempted it two or three years in a row. Okay. Um, Mona would like to know if Sean has done any other swims. Uh, yeah, I think swimming Lake Ontario was, was the highlight, but uh, he's done some other charity swims, mostly in rivers in Ontario. Um, there are some organized swims that are, are done for charities, and he's participated in those. But uh, Sean is basically a cyclist and uh, spends most of his time on the bike mm -hmm. these days. Um, Jillian wonders, can the SSO help the swimmers find boats for the swim, or do they have to find all those people on their own? Uh, can the SSO help what? Find the boats that are going to accompany them. Like, do they help with that, or do, do you have? Are you responsible for that yourself? And uh, really, the swimmer is responsible. Um, this is one of the most difficult things. Y you can imagine training to swim this kind of distance. The swimmer is focused on his on his training, but in fact, a lot of the work that has to go into planning one of these things is where do I get the boats? Where do I get the crew? 
if the weather isn't good, how do I get them to wait around for me? And mm -hmm. it's extremely difficult um, to coordinate all of that and still concentrate on your athletic effort. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a job that, that none of the swimmers like to do, but they all have to do. They have to talk people into coming out in their boats. It's a long period of time. You're not getting any sleep for 24 hours or maybe 30 hours. And uh, you've got to bring food and, and there's gasoline to burn. So it, you can imagine it's, it's, especially if there's four boats or more, uh, how difficult this is arranging. Yeah. And it's not a real um, uh, job that a swimmer expects to have to do when, when they sign up to do the swim, but it's something that, that is, is very important in the planning process. Yeah. Um, Betsy wants to know, uh, do people exclusively train in pools or do they do lake training as well? Uh, well, lake training at this time of year, as you can imagine, it's a little difficult uh, given the water temperatures. Um, so usually over the winter, it's uh, pool training. And, uh, and then they're all looking forward, I'm sure most swimmers are looking forward to when the uh, water's warm enough to get back in. And that's usually uh, early July. Uh, lake Ontario uh, stays quite cold uh, well into July sometimes. Uh, Niagara on the lake is where it's warmest because Lake Erie is warm water and it's shallow water and that's where it's flowing out into Lake Ontario and that's one of the reasons Toronto is so cold because it's very deep around Toronto so uh, you get those thermoclines near Toronto so yeah uh, they they much prefer to swim in, in fresh water and open water but uh, pools are often the only thing that are available to uh, to train in over the winter time. Um, Judy wants to know what happened to the swimmer that took 41 hours. <laughs> uh, Jay, yeah, he's, uh, he's mildly autistic. He swam to raise money for Autism Canada. Um, and, you know, he, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta congratulate him for, for persevering that long. Mm -hmm. Usually solo swims would, would pull somebody before then, but I think they gave him extra leeway. Uh, he missed uh, Maryland Bell Park, if I remember correctly, and ended up uh, on the Leslie Street spit. And at the end, he was suffering from mild hypothermia, and that's why he was hospitalized. Mm -hmm. That's all I remember anyways. Wow. Um, another question about the, the people who accompany. Uh, how many pacers are there usually, and how long will they swim for? That's an interesting question. Uh, pacers are uh, allowed only during daylight hours, not at night, obviously for safety reasons. And usually uh, pacers are only allowed within a certain distance of the finish. So as the swimmer's getting tired, uh, maybe he's gone through the whole night, the, day, the daylight comes, that's when the pacers are brought out to, to help, uh, help the swimmer in the last few miles uh, when they come into shore. So usually there's no four or five pacers maybe uh, who will swim along beside the swimmer and encourage him and talk to him and, uh, and try and get him over that sort of stretch where, my God, I'm never going to finish this swim. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ted would like to know how many boats Marilyn Bell had to accompany her. That's a good question. I never saw anything in the... Um, I never saw anything in the official reports or anything like that. Uh, I know that it was basically uh, a rowboat most of the way uh, with Gus Ryder on it. And, um, and then, of course, as she got closer to Toronto, there were a lot of boats coming out. There's one of the, something that's very interesting. If you go to the Solo Swims of Ontario site and you just Google Solo Swims, uh, there is a, uh, two recordings uh, made, by, made of Marilyn Bell speaking, one in 1954, not long after she completed her swim, and another in 1964 on the 10th anniversary of it. So, um, so Ted, if you have a chance, uh, go to the Solo, Sw Solo Swim site and uh, try to navigate around there to find the two recordings from Marilyn Bell. Uh, there's just a few more questions, if you don't mind. Not at all. Um, Shauna wonders about the shipping vessels and, and how, how do they avoid them, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's an area that uh, Solo Swims helps with. Um, they will contact the Coast Guard prior to a swim, and um, I mean immediately prior to a swim, and warn them that there is a swimmer crossing the lake, and would they please advise all the captains of the ships uh, to that effect. And so they are slightly forewarned, if you will. Uh, hopefully they're listening to their radio. 
these ships, though, they move very, very quickly. They, they it's, it's, you know, until you're out in the lake and seeing them go by, you don't realize what a force they are to contend. It's like a train on the water. And uh, I remember uh, Sean, you know, a ship got fairly close to Sean on, on his swim. And Sean remembers looking up and seeing a sailor on the deck. So that's how, how close it is. And of course, one of the problems they have with the boats is that these huge propellers stir up the cold water mm. underneath the thermocline. And if the swimmer uh, then goes in behind the boat, he feels that, that cold water for however long it lasts, usually only 50 or 60 yards. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's one of the fears I have, and I always, uh, on, on the swims, uh, advise swimmers not to start at night is because the last thing I want to do is to face uh, a ship at night when they can't see us clearly and we might not be able to see them coming in the direction they're going you know you can't tell the direction you, yeah. you see the ship's lights and you think whoa well, let's hope they're not coming this way <laughs> <laughs> well in that same vein um, Babs wonders as a parent was there any time where you're really concerned for Sean's safety during a swim and not at all. These, these swims are so well set up, you know. Um, there's a doctor on board usually. Um, there's trained uh, personnel. There's, uh, as I said, 15 to 20 people. So there's lots of eyes on the swimmer. There's usually a kayak or a, an inflatable. It's often an inflatable uh, right beside the swimmer. So they've got close eyes on them. And uh, the worst, the worst part is, you know, really late at night, maybe early morning, uh, when it's still pitch black, and everybody's tired and concentration is is wavering. Mm -hmm. and people just want to sleep any way they can, and uh, and that's when the swimmer might not be uh, as closely guarded. So, other than that, no, there was no there was no time I was really worried. <laughs> um, Gwen wants to know how much weight a swimmer might lose during the swim. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. No idea. I, I can ask. Sean's probably listening in. He can probably send a note, but I don't. <laughs> I don't think it's as appreciable because the water's cold. So swimmers know that they don't lose a lot of weight because generally the water's colder than the air, and the body is adding fat to uh, to to protect it. Um, Julian wants to know if the rules allow two swimmers to go across side by side ever, or is it strictly, I know that organization solo swims, but is there, um, maybe others that have done, uh, tandem swims? Never heard of a tandem swim. No. Um, I don't think anybody's attempted it. There have been relay swims where, uh, there'll be a swimmer will go in for half an hour. He comes out, another swimmer goes in for half an hour, etc. cetera. Um, and there's been several of those that have been very successful. They've been raced right across the lake with excellent, you know, Olympic class swimmers. But I've never heard of a tandem swim. Uh, I know people are very often planning to leave the same day, but they never seem to for one reason or another. So I've never heard of a tandem swim, sorry. And then Mona just wonders if Marilyn or Vicky would be available to do a talk at the museum, <laughs> which is a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I know uh, some people are, are, there's also some talks on the Solo Swim website from, uh, I think Vicky Keith has one. It's very inspirational. And uh, some of these swimmers, what they have to put into it uh, can be very inspiring. So yeah, maybe uh, that's a good idea for you to contact them. I got a couple um, through email as well, actually. Sure. Uh, uh, so Tony, this is from uh, John Scott. Do you plan on helping out any more swims or are you retired, so to speak? <laughs> well, I, you, yeah, John, thanks very much. Um, <laughs> there's a, the, a, a, lot, a lot of energy goes into these from the crew. Um, you know, the preparation for the boat, making sure it's available. Uh, if it's not available on the Monday because there's a storm, is it ever going to be available Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday? Um, you're, you're, you're used to, usually the swim start late in the day. And of course, you've been up the whole day anyway. So it's, it turns out you're up really for two full days by the yeah. time you finally get the boat back. Um, it, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of planning. And, uh, and as I said, with, I've done this for maybe 10 or 11 swims. Sean and I have done it. And you sort of get burnt out, quite frankly. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, John, but I'm in the burnt out stage right now. And if you wanted to swim again, I might help you. But uh, otherwise, uh, uh, no. 
<laughs> he also uh, said in, in his message that he lost 10 pounds on his swim, but it was not a recommended weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, John, uh, John had an amazing swim. As I said, 14 hours and 42 minutes, a spectacular time. Absolutely spectacular. He had perfect conditions, I trust. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Tony. A really interesting presentation. And thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, our next lecture is next Thursday, uh, May 21st at two o'clock. And uh, we've got Suzanne Bear presenting on the Medicis. Uh, it's part of our uh, famous and infamous biography program that's organized by David and Liz, uh, David Murray and Liz Surtees. Um, so hopefully you can join us for that. Um, Tony's talk is, is uh, part of our um, all, all Along the Waterfront lecture series that was scheduled to go this year. Um, so he is probably gonna do it live later on in the year or maybe early 2021, depending on when we can have public gatherings. Um, but they're all, uh, um, they're all complementing our exhibition, which we're gonna open when we reopen to the public, uh, called All Along the Waterfront. And so it's all about the relationship of Niagara the Lake to Lake Ontario and to the Niagara River and the history of um, those bodies of water with our community. So uh, hopefully you guys can uh, join us for more of those lectures and also to come see the exhibit when it opens. So thanks again, everyone. And thanks, we'll see you here next week. Thank you.